Okay, so we're in part three of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. And those who have been with us from the beginning, how's everyone doing with it? All right, yeah, not as many fell out as I thought. You know what I mean? You got a strong, those of you still in it are still in it, I guess, huh? So we're 20, 21 days of prayer and fasting. Those of you who don't know, every year we do it starting in January. And um, it's a time to set our, you know, a lot of people set New Year's resolutions. We started off with 21 days of prayer and fasting. We come to the Lord, and we say no to our flesh, and we humble ourselves before the Lord. And that's what the first week was all about. I taught today's uh, the third week into it, sermon-wise. And the first week was about why do we pray and fast? Well, we humble ourselves. The Bible says that uh, if you humble yourself before the Lord, he will lift you up. And so humbling, uh, fasting is a form of humbling ourselves. And um, we also come to the Lord. We say we turn off the TV and things that distract us from getting in the word and prayer. And we spend that time uh, seeking our breakthroughs. And we, every year we have this prayer jar here. And at the end of service, we always pray for it. And you guys could put your new prayers in there. What miracles are you believing for? What breakthroughs? It could be finances. It could be a job. It could be healing. It could be uh, salvation for a family member. Uh, how about our nation? Put that on there. Healing upon our land. Uh, my goodness. So uh, that's, that's why we do it every year. We, we want to have start our year off right with the Lord. And we believe when we do that, the rest of the year, we're setting the pace for the rest of the year. And we believe that the Lord's going to bless us and walk with us if we started off right with him. And the second week, Pastor Jim talked about last week, is about getting your miracle. And it ties in with the first week about there's a part on, that we have to do as Christians, an action, and then there's a reaction on God's part, right? You humble yourselves, action, and he will lift you up, reaction, right? Amen. If you knock, action, it will be opened, if you seek, you will find. If you ask, it will be given. Action to reaction. And he went through about obtaining your miracles, and he used the uh, saying that he got from Pastor Moses, um, heaven won't move unless you move. Right. And many times, Christians, there's a time to wait and be still, and there's a time to move and act out on faith. Amen? Right. And to trust the Lord. Now, faith doesn't mean just uh, throwing the sand up in the air and seeing where the wind blows. Just like we sang in the song today, we trust God, right? He calms the storm. He walks on the sea. He stands in the fire beside me. He carries his healing in his hands, right? We trust God. These are things we trust him. Why? Because he's always been faithful to do them in the past, and he's always going to be faithful to do it in the future. So when we step out in faith, it's because we have this trust and this confidence in him to do it again, right? He's faithful. Even when we're faithless, he remains faithful. So getting your miracles, and if you guys haven't listened to them, you go back and listen to them. I encourage you guys to do it on our, on our app or our website. You can find all our sermons there. But we're going to be moving into the third part today, which is prayer. Now, here's the thing about prayer. I know it's one of those Christian topics that you've heard a hundred times, right? You've heard a hundred different uh, messages on it or sermons on it. It's talked about all the time. And many times we think we can know everything there is about prayer, but prayer is so important in the Christian life that it should be that we need a continual reminder of its importance. And my prayer today about my message about prayer is that your prayer life will be taken to another level through this message. That you may obtain something new, and by this message, your prayer life, where it is right now, will get taken to another level. You may, uh, my prayer is that you guys will learn something new and receive something new. You guys ready? Excited? I find it interesting when you're reading about the Gospels and the disciples, the disciples asked Jesus to teach them something, to teach them how to pray. And I, th and I was thinking about it, you know, they didn't t ask him to teach them how to do miracles or how to cast out demons or how to do ministry or how to heal the sick, but they asked him of all the things to ask him is how to pray. Because when they saw Jesus praying, Things happened. Through the prayer, miracles happened and healings and demons were cast out. When Jesus prayed, heaven came to earth. When Jesus prayed, things changed. And they saw that. So they asked Jesus, teach us how to pray. And I want to read that passage in Luke 11, 1 through 4. If you guys got your Bibles, you go ahead and turn with me to Luke 11. And this is what's commonly known as the Lord's Prayer. 
And the thing about the Lord's Prayer is many times it's, it's become a religious, kind of like this religious, uh, you know, prayer. Um, and it's okay to pray this. There's nothing wrong with quoting the words of Jesus or praying the words of Jesus, right? But when he says, when they ask him to teach him how to pray, and he says, this is how you do it, there's principles there that we take from it. We, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean we have to quote it word for word, but there's truth in it that we extract from it of how to pray. So let's, let's read it in Luke 11. Now it came to pass, starting in verse 1, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples so he said to them when you pray say if you know it say with me our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day by day our daily bread and forgive us of our sins for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one you may have memorized it from the King James Version, so it's a word a little bit. Uh, I heard some thighs and these in there that, uh, you know, switched it up on you guys. Are you paying attention or what? So let's break these things down. First, he start, starts off by saying, hallowed. Lord, teach us how to pray. He said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So what does that mean? It means holy, right. It's the Greek word hagazio which to make holy, to separate from profane things and dedicate to God. So the first principle we take away from Jesus' prayer is that when we come to God, we need to recognize His holiness. We need to come to Him with a reverence that we're talking to a holy God and He allows us to talk to Him. It's not a right. He allows His kids, us Christians, to communicate with Him. And we're coming before a holy God, so we need to come to him with reverence. That our God, our creator, is a holy being, and in him there is no sin at all. And us as sinful creatures are coming to him with communication, with our prayers, our petitions, our concerns. And here's the thing. Once we realize and we come to him with reverence, and and dedicate the prayer to God in an act of holiness, um, we look at what else Jesus says. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what what does he mean by this? Because we know it, we quote it, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we know heaven as God's dwelling place, right? That's, let's just say, that's his house. That's his place where God dwells. Now, he's omnipresent, but the Bible talks about his main dwelling place, right? His, the throne of God in heaven. That's his home. In heaven, in his house, his rules, his will is always enacted out. Let me say that again. It's his house, it's his rules, and his will is always done in heaven. That's why Jesus is saying, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. His house, his rules, his will is always done. We're praying that his will, his rules, him enacting upon his will will also be done here on earth as we're praying to him as he does in heaven. And that prayer is enacting that transfer, our request from his will playing out in heaven down to earth because his will is always enacted out in heaven and we're asking him to bring his kingdom his heavenly realm his will that's always enacted in heaven down here on earth and just as we have our own households households and our own rules and our will is enacted within our households so does God right for example kids or grandkids you have certain rules you lay out for your kids or grandkids or whoever may be, right? You, you can't watch this. Can't say that. This is bedtime. You can do this, right? Don't talk like that in my household. You ain't watching that in my household, right? We have rules. We have wills. And if we're the head of the household as parents or grandparents, you're abiding by the rules in my household, right? This is my house. 
if you don't live by my rules, you can get out, right? We've, it's, that's either been said to us or we've said it before, right? You can find another house to live under, but in my house, you're not doing that. So if, you, if their kids or grandkids don't abide by the rules of the household, then they don't get to abide in the blessings of the household. Make sense, right? If they don't abide by the rules of the household, they don't get to obtain the blessings of that household. If, they, if your kid ain't doing, if they're sneaking out and doing, living a life, not in my household, you're no longer going to get the care and the covering and three hots and a cot and a, fina- and a financial blessing, right? Amen. Electricity, water, those things that aren't free that, you know, just leave the faucet on, why don't you? When you start paying for the bills, then you realize, like, I'm turning that faucet off, right? So if you, if, you don't, if you don't abide by the rules, you don't obtain the blessings. So here's the thing. In 1 John 5.14, it says this, And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if, any, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. So we're talking about God's will here in in connection with prayer in reference to bringing his enacted will, his rules, his kingdom down here upon earth to be played out. So if we pray, this is the confidence that we have toward him that if we ask anything according to his, say it, will, he hears us. So the question is, It's an if-then kind of statement. If we pray according to his will, then he hears us. So the question is, how do we pray according to his will? Right? That's the question. How do we know we're aligned in his will when we pray? And we're not just uh, heaping up empty phrases or just praying according to our own will. And I'm going to go through three points, three keys to praying God's will for you note takers out there. Three keys to praying in God's will. One, we must come to God relationally. We must come to God relationally. That's why Jesus starts his prayer with our Father who art in heaven, right? Our Father who is in heaven, holy be your name. Addressing God as Father connects the relationship. Jesus, addressing God as his Father in heaven, comes to him as relational, connecting the relationship. Now, it doesn't mean we have to say, dear Heavenly Father, before every prayer, but we coming to him, first, with a sense of holiness, second, that we're building a relationship here with our Father in heaven, amen, and that connection. So the principle that Jesus said in his prayer Our Father in heaven, he's making the point that there's a relational connection between us and God. Our prayer life should amplify how we pursue God in a relationship. I'm going to say that again. Our prayer life should amplify how we pursue God in our relationship. How we talk to someone reflects our relationship towards somebody. And that applies in our real life. See, I I continually say this. Through scripture, there's basic applicable principles in our life. We can apply them to relationships and whatever it may be. And as we get that connection in real life, there's a deeper spiritual truth. Many times we try to over-spiritualize things. What does this mean? No. You can make the connection in your life, how we talk to people, how we communicate with people, how we pursue people reflects our relationships with them. And so be it with God in our prayer life should amplify what uh, our relationship looks like. So the question remains, how do you come to God in prayer? Is do we only make 911 calls to God in our prayer life? Do we get on the the emergency God hotline and say, God, it's me again, help. Oh, hey, how's it going? Uh, I haven't talked to you since last emergency phone call. I see uh, things haven't gotten any better for you, right? Is our prayer life only 
this emergency 911 call. God, help me. I'm suffering. I'm hurting. The question is, what if you pursued earthly relationships like that? What if you pursued somebody only when you needed something? Well, there you go. You wouldn't have a wife. You wouldn't have a friend. You wouldn't have a good relationship with your kids. Any relationship. If you only pursued somebody when you want something, they're going to know that relationship that you're pursuing isn't a healthy one. People could sense that. So when we go to God, prayers are a relational communication with God. When we go to God with what we want, listen to this, without a concern of the cultivation of the father-child relationship, without a concern for that, we are just using God and not relating to him. The 911 call. We're just using him. And nobody likes to be used. Right? Nobody likes to be used. What about as parents? When you're in good relation with your kids... Everything's, they're doing what you laid out for them. Everything's good. You love them. And you just want to bless them with everything, right? But if you got a rebellious kid and you're going through a hard season with a kid in particular, and they come up and they, they're not acting like they love you. It feels like they're just in rebellion with everything. And then they come up and ask for something. It feels like they're just using you for something, right? Anybody felt like that? Now, I know maybe their intentions may not be like that. Maybe as a kid, you don't. You don't know you're using somebody, but you understand the feeling. It's like, no, you've been rebellious. You haven't been doing anything I've been saying. You've been flunking your grades. You've been this and this and that, and now you're going to come and ask me for this thing. It's a feeling of being used because the relationship, the obedience, the communication isn't there. And nobody likes feeling used. So the first key To praying in God's will is first we must come to Him relationally. We must understand that we're communicating with God as the the father-child relationship. And our communication is relationship, uh, is relational communication, uh, communication is our prayer. Number two is we must be obedient to His revealed will. We must be obedient to God's revealed will. God has a secret will. And a revealed will. Did you guys know that? He has things he has not revealed to us. And he has things he he has revealed to us. And Deuteronomy 29.29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words in his law. So what has he revealed to us? Well, he's revealed to us um, his law. This moral standard, right? We know that. His revealed will will to us. How Christians should behave. Morality. How we interact with other Christians. How we interact with non-believers. What we do outside of church. Our moral standard. The gospel message. Our, the Great Commission, right? Go make disciples. All these things in the Bible, He's revealed to us. This is His revealed will. This is the heart and mind of God. As in as much, He's revealed to us, right? So... He also has secret will. And when we, when we pursue God and we seek Him, we know His revealed will. Just like in a relationship with our parents, parents to kid, right? The more our kids in, in the relationship, we get to know them, the more our kids understand our revealed will. But see, here's the thing is that This connects him with the first point I made. The pursuing of the relationship, the revealed, the understanding of the revealed will. The more you pursue a relationship, the more you understand somebody's will, right? So, in John 14, 15, it says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. This is Jesus talking. So, if we love Jesus, we're going to obey his revealed will. It makes sense with our kids too, right? They show their love towards us by obedience and we show our love towards them by blessing them and vice versa. I mean, there's other ways to show love, but it's just an example. So as parents, we also have a secret will that we haven't revealed to our kids. Many times uh, our, our kids come and ask us for something and we already know the answer before we tell them, right? 
the secret will that has not yet been revealed to them. So as we have house rules and standards that what we will accept and what we, what we won't accept in our households, we also have the hidden wills unrevealed to our kids. And most of the time, if our kids aren't obeying our revealed will, the rules laid out, then the blessings from the hidden will will, will never come. Right, guys? If they don't obey our revealed will, then the blessings from the hidden will will never become because nobody likes the feeling of being used, right? Now, there's an exception to that. We call that grace, and we've all experienced it, right? Like, you don't deserve this, but this is grace, and I'm going to give it to you anyways. And Jesus showed that on the cross, and many times as parents, we need to show that, amen? As much as we don't want it sometimes, we didn't deserve the atonement of the cross, right? While we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. Amen? So, we don't know. <clears throat> Here's the thing. Applying that to God, right? So, we don't know God's hidden will if we don't obey his revealed will. We don't know his hidden will. For example, things you're asking for. If our kids come and ask for something, we haven't given them an answer yet. When we go to God, we're asking for things. We're asking for guidance. Things we don't know yet. His hidden will for us. The hidden answers. But if we don't come to God and obey the revealed will, His rules, His commandments for our life, then don't be surprised when heaven don't show up here on earth. Amen. When all we use, when we live like hell and we only talk to God in this 911 emergency fo- contact with Him, don't be surprised when heaven doesn't show up. Amen. His blessings from His hidden will. Many Christians want this jack-in-the-box God where they wind him up without understanding who he is and what he requires, his revealed will to us. But if you, so if you skip the relationship aspect of it with the Father and you don't come under the rule of the Father, then don't be surprised when the, when the hidden will isn't revealed, when heaven don't show up here, when the blessings don't show up. So it starts with coming to him, knowing he's holy, knowing that we have to build a relationship and communicate him as a father to child. And uh, second of all, obeying what he's laid out for us, not living this blatantly rebellious life and expecting a 911 call to him every once in a while. It's going to get the, us the answers and the blessings we want. You guys understand that? Amen. That's why Jesus said, your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. In Jeremiah, this is what God said to Jeremiah in 33, verse 3. Call to me, I will answer you. I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. Call to me and I will answer you. This cultivation that Jeremiah had with God in building this relationship. He says, yeah, you come to me, you build this relationship to me as you're doing. And I'm going to reveal hidden things to you that you do not yet know. See, in life... Sometimes we need something called wisdom from God to give us direction and things that we yet do not know. And God says, I'll reveal my hidden will to you as you pursue this relationship with me, as you come over my, come under my, my revealed will to you, my, my laws and my commandments. Amen, church? In part three, first we must come to God relationally. Two, we must be obedient to God's revealed will. And three, we must come to God with confidence in the unknown. Confidence in the unknown. So many times, we as Christians, we don't come to God in confidence. Why? A, because we don't know the Father personally. Imagine going up to a stranger and putting your trust in a stranger and asking your, a stranger to come through for you. We would definitely lack confidence in that, right? Right? We would definitely lack confidence. You can't put confidence in a stranger that you don't know, that you haven't cultivated a relationship. Trust comes over time, right? Amen. Trust is built. So A, we don't know the Father personally. Or B, we are not obedient to the will of the Father because we might not like the answers of his direction. We might not like the answer God gives us. No kid likes hearing no when they're asking for a new Xbox. They want to hear yes. But if your life ain't in line and your priorities ain't straight, you ain't getting an Xbox because I know giving it to you is just going to make your priorities worse. 
So, when we come to God in confidence, we must know that even though it's maybe an answer we don't want, a door that we think is open from God, but it ain't from Him, we must have confidence in Him that whatever the answer is, wherever He directs us, it's always for our own good, even though we may not like the answer we hear. Amen, guys? Our selfish desires should never outweigh the confidence that we should have coming to the Father in prayer. In 1 John 5, verse 14 and 15, it says, and this is the, this is the verse I read already. I'm going to add verse 15. And this is the confidence that we have toward uh, Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, and whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked from Him. The confidence coming to Him. So, confidence in the unknown is key because when we come to God in prayer and we have confidence in Him, we're putting our trust and our faith in God and what is yet not seen and what is unknown and direction in life and decisions. We need to have confidence in God that He will take care of His children. Amen? Amen. That he's done it before in the past and he'll do it again in the future. And even though we may not see it, we know God hears us if we pray according to his will and that he's going to take care of us. And that's how we have confidence in him when we come to him in prayer. And you guys, and I reference uh, this verse or the second part of this verse, but you guys are familiar with these. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be open. I did reference that verse. What father among you, father, even mothers, apply this to your parenting or however you may, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? I said that. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So us as parents, we're not going to harm our kids when they're in need, right? But we're sinful people. We're flawed people. Our Father who isn't sinful, who isn't flawed, how much more will He bless us and not harm us and give us things like the Holy Spirit who dwells us, our comforter and our helper? In other words, God won't harm us. It's rhetorical. God won't harm us when we ask for things. Amen, church? And this is the confidence that we need to have coming to God. I'm going to have the worship team come on up here. Help me close this out. I'm going to give you one last example. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? We're familiar with these three guys. Daniel interpreted a dream, and him and his three amigos were put in the governing places of the Babylonian empire to call the shots, shot callers, and this pagan Christians in a pagan empire calling shots in the government. And there's this decree that went out, you guys are familiar with the story, that they built this statue of this arrogant, prideful Nebuchadnezzar, and when the band plays and the banjo starts and the banda music, dun, 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 when you hear that song, you bow down, and you and you give <laughs> and you give worship, and you give worship to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Fill in with whatever music you want, right? When the band, <laughs> when the band starts playing, I embellished a little bit, okay? Oh, geez. So whenever the band starts playing, the scripture says, you bow down and you worship, or you're going to get thrown in the fiery furnace, right? So, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they say, "Uh uh-uh, we ain't bowing to the statue. Remember, these guys were placed in the king's court. They were government officials. They were favored by the guy who's man out of gold there. So they saw him and they said, look, your homies over here ain't bowing down to the banda. We need to do something about it. We need to throw them in the fiery furnace. And this is what they say. In verse 17, this, if this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, 
Be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Amen. This is what he's saying concerning the unknown, concerning the death. He's like, look, Jesus or God, remember, remember they saw three guys in there, or they threw three in and they saw four, and many believe that was Jesus, uh, uh, you know, a manifestation of Jesus in there with them. Um, but anyways, God, they believed in God, was able to deliver them, and he did, just probably not how they expected, out of this fiery furnace. But if not, that's a highlightable three words right there. If God does not deliver us, we still are not going to worship your gods. Here's the thing. We need more Christians like that today. Look, we trust in God. We come to God in confidence because we understand that he can deliver us from persecution. But just in just case if he doesn't, I'm still not going to compromise. Amen. Even if persecution comes and with my head off my body, I'm still going to trust the, the, the Lord's word. I'm still going to, to walk in his commandments and still come over under his revealed will to me. I'm not going to compromise even if God chooses not to because guess what? There's something called martyrs in the Bible and even today. All over the world today, every day Christians die. They're called martyrs, where God has not delivered them from the fiery furnace. Does that mean God abandoned them? No. no. But they stood firm, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in their faith and didn't compromise and died for the Lord. Amen. And they'll receive a, the martyr's crown for that in heaven one day. It's a reward we'll give them, because that's got to be one of the toughest things I would imagine you could do. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That we know he'll be there with us and stand with us in the fire, as the song said. But even if he doesn't, I ain't moving. Amen. 